Hi, everyone. I'm Andrew Eberhardt. I'm a postdoc at Cadbury IPMU. Today, I'm going to be talking about ultralight dark matter. So getting right into it then, uh, let's first describe what I mean when I say ultralight dark matter. So you may have heard the term ultralight, fuzzy, scalar field, wave, uh, dark matter. Uh, these all refer to the same thing. And what we mean by them is kind of the lowest mass end of this mass parameter space for dark matter. So anything kind of in the range of 10 to the minus 22 to 10 to the minus 19 uh, electron volts. Kind of the interesting thing about this range is that it has implications for cosmology and astrophysics uh, and structure formation. Specifically. So ultralight fields are kind of a generic prediction of string theory. And so when we talk about models which motivate these particles, uh, oftentimes we'll talk about uh, things like the axon. Um, but when we model them for the purpose of constraints and for the purpose of simulations, usually we model them in this way. And that is a single spin zero non-relativistic classical field. And so much of the work that I'll talk about today will be making these uh, kind of assumptions about the field, um, these approximations that make it more amenable to analysis. And most of the work will look at this. Um, but of course, by now, there has been actually quite a lot of work uh, extending uh, the kind of vanilla uh, fuzzy dark matter model to include models with higher spin, um, with multiple fields, um, relativistic corrections and quantum corrections as well. But historically, uh, what motivated this model was uh, the forecast problem, the small scale uh, structure problems in cosmology. So you see here that um, fuzzy dark matter, ultralight dark matter gives a core uh, instead of the cusp that was predicted uh, by dark matter only lambda CDM simulations, which of course were in tension uh, with observations. Now, this is coming from the fact that uh, ultralight dark matter suppresses structure on small scales. And it also means that it changes uh, the halo mass function on small scales as well. And so this was thought, oh, well, this could also solve um, the missing satellite problem. Which of course, these days, uh, we don't necessarily think of these small-scale structure problems as being as dire, perhaps, as we once did. We know that um, observational uh, challenges um, or baryonic corrections uh, may explain some of these small-scale structure problems. However, dark matter-only solutions remain interesting, and uh, ultralight dark matter is kind of one of these dark matter-only solutions. And so if we set the dark matter mass to be about 10 to the minus 22, um, then it was realized that this would be, uh, would create a cutoff scale that's about correct to describe um, the original small scale structure problems in cosmology. And so this mass scale has received a lot of attention. And that's why uh, kind of all these constraints, for instance, this constraint plot constraints that came out in the last six years are all kind of interested in um, this regime, right? It's also why that plot I showed you earlier, uh, this one, has the kind of left edge of 10 to the minus. I would say recent work, though, has kind of the interesting interpretation not only of ruling out um, this kind of model that was solving the uh, small-scale structure problems originally, but also just kind of putting a lower mass bound on the dark matter in general, right? You should kind of think of this as living in the same space as these um, other cosmological bounds we have, right? Where um, the fermionic bound tells us uh, the lightest fermion, uh, that could be dark matter, the one dark matter bound tells us the lightest um, reduced dark matter. Right, and so each of these bounds is not constraining any particular model necessarily, but constraining the kinds of models that you can write down. Right? And so studying uh, these bounds is still quite interesting, even if the original motivation um, for the ultralight dark matter is no longer. And so a lot of recent work is going to be pushing um, this lower mass bound up. And we actually have uh, done pretty well. You know, a few decades uh, of mass have been um, cut off. So I'm going to limit the scope of this review to work 
on ultralight or fuzzy dark matter that has implications um, for structure. So it kind of all goes together. So what's not included, but it was still very interesting and very important um, are these topics here, each of which almost motivates a review all on its own. So for instance, dark matter below the traditional 10 to the negative 22 EV uh, bound could be interesting for uh, dark energy reasons. For instance, um, black hole super radiance kind of puts bounds above the um, range that we're usually interested in. And also it doesn't really depend on the um, field describing the dark matter. And I'm just puts bounds on the existence of fields, right? And then ultralight dark matter with uh, non-gravitational interaction with the standard model. Uh, there's a whole field surrounding that as well, right? all the way up to uh, your traditional actual product. Um, so these subjects are covered in uh, this Ferreira, uh, this review by Elisa here. Um, the talk I'm going to talk about is going to be much more similar in scope to that of uh, the review by Lam Hui instead. Uh, and then I also put some links here to uh, discussions of um, Black Hole Super that I was interested in. So jumping into the pheno then, kind of the first prediction historically of ultralight dark matter was uh, what we call nowadays the quantum pressure. This is essentially a pressure, um, or it's kind of a pseudo pressure that resists the formation of structure below certain scale. Now an important caveat and why you often see these little quotations around the quantum pressure, is that this really isn't quantum. This is entirely contained in the uh, classical field theory. In fact, any two variables that are related by a Fourier transform will have what looks like a um, uncertainty principle associated with them that will prevent you from forming structure below certain scales. Uh, we get this um, kind of modified gene scale. So this, this, this scale below which structure doesn't form by looking, comparing the gravitational, uh, the time scale associated with the gravitational growth to this time scale associated with the oscillation of the free field. When these two things are equal. Um, that gives us our scale, uh, our scale below which uh, structure can form. And so in this original paper, they, they simulated this and found that indeed uh, structure doesn't form below this scale. And these uh, simulations are quite easy to reproduce these days. Um, you can see here that if I run a full dark matter simulation of the gravitational collapse of, uh, the, of uh, over density in a single spatial dimension, that it essentially forms structure right down to the resolution of the simulation. In the fuzzy dark matter case, that doesn't happen. It's clearly a scale below which structure can't form. And that's about the scale of the degree waves. And you will see that it'll just kind of oscillate back there uh, back and forth there uh, in equilibrium uh, for an arbitrary amount of time. <clears throat> now, another important implication of this quantum pressure is a modified transfer function. So the initial conditions, the initial perturbations uh, that you would simulate are actually going to be different for fuzzy dark matter, again, just because on small scales, we're resisting uh, the formation of um, structures. So this plot here shows um, this transfer function, which was originally calculated in that first um, paper, kind of compared to uh, the transfer functions from warm and interacting um, dark matter, which of course, uh, pretty dark matter is often compared to because those two models are also uh, intended to solve small scale structure problems. And there'd be also problems with small scale structure. Now, one of the other most um, studied phenomena is um, the phenomena of these solitons, and that's these kind of persistent over-densities at the center of every fuzzy dark matter halo. Now, we know that if we solve the um, spherically average uh, potential of the ultralight dark matter, that these solitons, these cores of these galaxies, um, are just the ground state of the eigenvalue problem associated with that potential. Um, but the mass and the radius of these cores has been the focus of a large amount of study. And there's really, um, I mean, we, we kind of, we know how they behave, but it, these specific scaling relations, um, there's a little bit of debate in the literature. It depends on how you set up the initial condition. This will end up being really important once we get to our constraint, because we'll, we will take the scaling relations derived from our uh, full nonlinear field simulations and um, use them to make arguments about what cores 
in um, galaxies we observe today. Kind of more recently, people have been looking at the uh, phenomena of these density brands. So if I take a slice through an ultralight dark matter halo, I get these kind of order one uh, fluctuations in the density. Now, this comes from the fact that uh, we have streams of dark matter passing each other at the same position. So in this animation I'm showing you here, I take two streams with some sort of velocity difference, rather some sort of momentum difference, and I vary that momentum difference. The frequency of the spatial oscillations I get uh, changes as I change the momentum difference between these two streams. In fact, it is due to Broly uh, wavelength associated with that momentum difference. And so unlike the particle case now, the uh, ultralight dark matter case will have these kind of order one fluctuations between zero and twice the um, average density profile. And these higher um, energy modes, right, are what's giving us this granular structure there. So you can kind of approximate the evolution of these granules just using uh, interference between the higher energy modes solved from this eigenvalue problem. Now, the last phenomena I'm going to talk about is uh, relativistic pressure. So if I now no longer consider my Schrodinger field, but bump it up to a relativistic uh, Klein-Gordon field, then the fact that the Klein-Gordon field oscillates at its uh, Compton frequency, rather the frequency associated with its mass, this creates uh, an oscillating potential that goes um, on the Compton time scale as opposed to the Burley time scale, which is the kind of slow varying uh, Newtonian potential that we're used to. Now, this oscillating potential is uh, V squared suppressed uh, compared to the slowly varying potential, which of course um, makes sense, right? Uh, the relativist correction uh, shouldn't be much larger than, um, than V squared. Uh, but nonetheless, this uh, gives us a uh, kind of Compton uh, frequency oscillation in our um, potential area. And this can be uh, probed with things that are very sensitive to the structure of space time, pulsar experience. So I'm going to now talk about the uh, numerics in the field. So how do we represent these things numerically? Now, almost every result uh, every phenomenological prediction, um, with few exceptions, and every constraint is going to rely on the results of simulations um, in some way. It's going to be tied to some sort of numerical um, result. So kind of the first thing you can do is what I've already talked about. Right? You can take this transfer function, uh, which is different for fuzzy dark matter. So uh, using different initial conditions. And then you can just run a normal uh, cold dark matter fluid or n body simulation using these different initial conditions and uh, look at the uh, predictions um, for those initial conditions. Now, I've linked here Axion CAM, which is one of the repositories um, which is most commonly used um, to create these uh, initial conditions given a real type of now, the next thing you can do is this uh, eigenvalue decomposition method. Uh, this I linked another repo here, which is uh, public, which uh, allows you to do the method I'm going to talk about. So if we solve the eigenvalue problem of the um, radial potential, uh, we get a bunch of eigenvalues, which we can sort by their energy number and their angular momentum number. Now, we can sum these eigenvalues uh, choosing weights such that we reproduce the original um, density profile that solved the eigenvalue problem in the first place. Uh, we can numerically find these weights. And then we can sum all the eigenvalues up with these weights and uh, random phases between the eigenvalues. And if we do that, we'll get something that uh, is a fairly good approximation for what we think an ultralight dark matter halo should be like. Uh, and this uh, halo uh, in this paper here 
uh, was created using just this method. Now, we can go one step further here and we can give all of those eigenvalues some sort of time-dependent phase, where the phase now depends on the um, energy and the time uh, uh, of those eigenvalues. And this was probably most famously done uh, in this paper doll and Krasov here, where uh, this type of um, simulation, which makes this kind of steady state uh, approximation, right, that the eigenvalues don't change uh, over time, um, was used to predict the uh, kind of stellar heating of ultra faint worlds. Right? Um, but we don't have to do that. We can also take these uh, this halo that we've constructed with this eigenvalue sum, and we can um, use that as the input, the initial conditions of a full nonlinear simulation now of an isolated halo. And so then kind of the main thing, or rather the kind of most accurate thing we can do then is to run these full nonlinear simulations where now we directly integrate the Schrodinger Poisson uh, equations, not making any sort of approximation, or rather only making the uh, kind of non-relativistic classical field approximation. Uh, so this was perhaps most famously um, done here by um, the sheave simulations. Uh, again, these are going to be really important because we're going to use the result of these simulations um, to extrapolate what um, kind of use the scaling relation uh, here to determine what our halo should look like um, compared to the observed halos we actually observe, right? So I'm going to take a moment to discuss these uh, full field simulations because I think they also contain a lot of really interesting things. So uh, these full field simulations um, essentially work by um, putting your field on some sort of grid. Um, there are fixed resolution and dynamic resolution uh, simulation integrators which exist. I link two of them here. Axionics is a dynamic resolution. Uh, integrator and Pi Ultralight is a fixed resolution one. Uh, there, there are others, but these are two of the most popular, which are also public. Um, now, what we're doing uh, essentially at the start, we are going to place a complex field um, on a grid, right, representing our space, where the Square amplitude of this field corresponds to a density, a spatial density, and the um, spatial gradient of the phase of this field to give us information about the uh, velocity. Now I can um, use Schrodinger's equation then to create a kind of kick drift kick update scheme. So I have Schrodinger's equation in the top right there. It's not difficult to solve Schrodinger's equation, right? I just um, put the Hamiltonian in the exponential. Now this contains a kinetic and a potential component. Uh, I can separate those two um, up to a commutation relation between the, um, the two components. And if I do that, I'll get this kind of uh, leapfrog uh, kick drift kick integrator that is uh, often used in n body simulations. Um, and we like this integrator because it has a nice property of being uh, symplectic and uh, canceling errors to a high order in um, DT. Um, and from this equation of motion, uh, we can actually get some, um, some interesting uh, physics, or we, we can read them off. So we know that ultralight dark matter has to approach cold dark matter on the large scale. And of course, this is because cold dark matter, uh, lambda CDM, is extremely predictive on these scales, right? It's extremely successful. And so any viable dark matter model has to reproduce uh, large scales. It's not necessarily obvious that I would just handed you a classical field that this would be the case. Um, but if we look at our two updates, so the two I have here, the potential update on the left and the kinetic update on the right. And then we recall that the velocity can be related to the spatial gradient of the phase. And likewise, just taking the Fourier transform, position can be 
related to the momentum gradient of the phase. And we take the gradient then of the change in the phase that each of these operators will impart on the field. Um, we can see that we actually recover in the bottom two lines there, Hamilton's equation, right? Which just say that the velocity should update by the acceleration and that the position should update by the velocity. And of course, this is exactly the same equations which explain how uh, n bodies move in an n body simulation. And that's why uh, ultralight dark matter approaches this on the large scales. And so you can see that if I set them up in the same initial conditions, um, that on the large scales, they agree. In fact, in these phase spaces, um, we can see that the discrepancies start to creep in once we get below a certain resolution in the phase space. Right on the left here, I'm showing you the evolution of a um, gravitational uh, collapse of an overdensity in one spatial dimension for a traditional cold dark matter on the right or the second class. Okay, so now let's talk about uh, constraints, right? So on the right here, I have the constraints separated by the method used to produce that constraint. So let's focus first on the halo mass. <clears throat> so like I said, the fuzzy dark matter makes a different prediction for what the transfer function um, would be. And this means that we can start off with different initial conditions and we can run a normal fluid or end body simulation forward and we'll get different final conditions. Um, specifically, you can get a different halo mass function for instance, right? And this halo mass function can be compared with uh, observations of a uh, halo mass function in the late time universe and be used to uh, rule out certain masses which predict transfer functions which are discrepant with those observations. Now, perhaps the next most studied um, constraint is uh, the cores. And this kind of makes sense, right? This was the original motivation for this model. So fuzzy dark matter predicts a soliton core instead of a cusp. Uh, so you get these solitons at the center of all these halos. Um, we know, right, these are the um, ground states of the um, eigenvalue problem. Um, so we can look at the uh, scaling relation of these cores. So how does their radius, how does their mass um, change with a uh, different mass using full nonlinear simulations? Uh, we can extrapolate that to make arguments about what kind of cores should live in um, halos that we actually go and observe, right? And that galaxy that we actually observe. And that, of course, makes a prediction for the velocity curve that you would observe and, um, that is discrepant with the kind of core that we think should exist in that galaxy. And then we can rule out that kind of uh, that mass of the dark one. Um, so this is largely studied. Uh, informed by the results of these nonlinear simulations and using these kind of semi-analytic descriptions of these uh, cores and to compare with observations of um, the uh, velocity profiles of the actual thing. Um, what we can also do is not just using the semi-analytic approximation, but you can actually also sum up these eigenvalues to create these um, these halos, right? Using this eigenvalue method and that's something that was that was done quite recently, and then using these um, these constructed halos to uh, rule out um, dark matter now, instead of just using the, uh, this, the scaling relations derived in the earlier. So recently, some of the most um, kind of strong constraints on the ultralight dark matter have been looking at um, the granules now. So we should recall that fuzzy dark matter halos have density granules, and these are due to interfering modes. Um, interestingly, and I'll point it out uh, here, these granules are actually quite sensitive to the dark matter microphysics beyond the mass. So uh, introducing higher spins, introducing additional fields, uh, mixing um, dark matter masses, uh, adding quantum corrections in mean, the specific quantum state that the dark matter is in. It's been shown that these are quite, um, have quite a large effect on the, the, the granules. So this is kind of an interesting probe uh, which motivates me. 
And uh, some work has already been done studying how these brains behave to use various uh, kind of extensions of the mineral level. Um, but what these granules do, if they do indeed exist, is they create kind of this, um, this granular potential. And for instance, if you were to look at a uh, strongly lensed um, like uh, quasar jets, um, as was done in this paper here, um, you can see that these granules would prevent the image um, from kind of being as sharp as we actually observe it to be. And that's because the light wouldn't focus uh, in the way consistent with what we actually observe. And so you can use that to kind of rule out the existence of these granules and just rule out um, dark matter with certain elements. So, uh, yeah, it's kind of preventing the, the sharpness of the image. Um, some of the strongest constraints, though, have been looking at the way these granules would affect uh, stars, so any, any sort of compact um, stellar um, like grouping. So, uh, most recently and most famously in this uh, paper by Galal and Krastov, where we approximated these kind of over densities as uh, quasi particles. In there. Uh, the quasi particles are about the size of the Fermi wave, and uh, what these quasi particles do is that as stars uh, go around their orbits, they uh, exchange energy with the quasi particles. Right, they have kind of like little gravitational scattering events with them, and over time they extract energy from the um, quasi particles, and this heats up the dispersions, and this causes the uh, half light radius to grow, and if it grows beyond what you observe, then you can rule out, again, the existence of these granules and thus the uh, existence of field for the lesser elements. Uh, and this was done for uh, Segway 1 and 2 in this wall and cross off paper, and actually a stellar cluster in Airy 2 in this uh, Martian Lima paper. So any sort of uh, kind of compact uh, object um, in the presence of this kind of granular field, you have this kind of structure. Uh, we can also look at lime and alpha. So again, fuzzy dark matter is preventing the formation of structure below certain scales. Um, you can go ahead and run your uh, CDM simulations using the altered transfer function that we've already talked about. This will make a prediction um, for the kind of power spectrum of, along the line of sight at the um, at the late time universe, right? If you can compare this to the power spectrum you actually observe in the uh, lime and alpha data. Uh, and if it suppresses too much structure below uh, on the scales of Jordan and Lyman alpha data, then you know that it's um, inconsistent with that data. Uh, so the final thing I'm going to talk about is these um, pulsar timing rates, which are actually still uh, just a projected constraint, but, but a quite interesting one, especially uh, given kind of all the recent success and um, all the excitement surrounding uh, pulsar timing. So we recall that we have this kind of fluctuating um, part in a million um, potential that uh, is everywhere where the, uh, the normal fuzzy dark matter potential is. And that this potential fluctuates on the Compton frequency. Uh, and it turns out the Compton frequency is about the uh, observation time, or at the Compton time, it's about the observation time the pulsar timing array for about 10 to the minus 23-ish um, mass. Um, this then creates a difference in the potential at Earth and at the pulsar, so a gravitational redshift, um, then if you were to observe the frequency, uh, that varies on the uh, Compton time. And you can show that um, this would produce a varying signal that the pulsar timing um, would be sensitive. Um, and so uh, our observations of our pulsars wouldn't be able to be more precise um, than this kind of noise introduced by this um, this oscillating signal. Like the, uh, the observed frequency would vary uh, on this time scale. So where then does that leave us uh, as, as a field? And I think um, at this point, we can kind of confidently say that the, uh, the vanilla dark matter model is, um, is, is quite dead at this point. And by uh, vanilla, of course, what I mean is the kind of original um, fuzzy dark matter model, which we were looking at, which is kind of 10 to the minus 22 um, EV 
dark matter, which was supposed to solve small scale structure problems, many of which uh, we're not we're not even really uh, particularly interested in anymore. At least not interested in the dark matter only solution to. Um, and the reason I say this is because you know not only are there many constraints, but these constraints kind of cover a lot of different physics, all of which is telling us the same thing. So, for instance, if I sort the constraint by method, we see we have many observation probes, right? Probes of the halo mass function. Uh, the profiles of specific galaxies of kind of the um, strong lensing events of um, specific objects of uh, the stellar dispersions of um, dwarf galaxies, um, lime and alpha forests, and assume to be pulsar time and light. All these things are kind of telling us the same thing. You know, you know, structure exists on smaller scales um, than. Um, or for many reasons, you know, then then photo gaffing would produce or these granules are inconsistent with what is observed, for instance. Uh, and this isn't just looking at one of the predictions of this model, right? This isn't just looking at the impact on the transfer function. This isn't just looking at um, the size of the solitons or even just the fact that uh, granules may or may not exist or this relativistic pressure, right? We're really using each one of these different probes, uh, and they're kind of all telling us the same thing about the vanilla model. It's just that it really can't be this kind of nice proxy. Um, I'm also going to talk about kind of the different numerical methods that have been used. So you might think, oh, well, you know, is it really, does it really make sense to only use um, n body simulations, which of course are going to mix or miss out on like granular um, behavior, for instance, or does it make sense to use, like, uh, kind of extrapolate these uh, full nonlinear simulations in all the regions that these extrapolations are applied to? Um, but that's that's not, you know, we're not just relying on one numerical method here. Like, right? we have we have methods which uh, probe the effect of the transfer function, right? We have methods that are kind of semi-analytical in the sense that they uh, they're informed by nonlinear simulations, but then those relationships are applied elsewhere. Um, but we also have methods that, um, you know, use these kind of approximate simulations, right? These, these kind of eigenvalue uh, steady state simulations. And they really um, all appear to be telling us the same thing. And so what we have then is the vanilla model ruled out with uh, many different observations, uh, probing a wide range of physics, uh, studied using kind of a wide range of um, different analysis tools or different numerical methods and so uh, the statement that the vanilla model is, is dead I think at this point we can, we can kind of make um, quite confident but um, this has motivated kind of a wide range of work looking into extensions of the model and this is this is interesting so at the beginning of the um, talk I said the following statement usually we describe the model using a single spin zero non relativistic classical field. Now, at this point, uh, we've looked at how self interactions change these predictions. So, for instance, we know that self interactions change the profiles of solitons, right? If you deepen the potential well by adding a, some sort of quartic term, for instance, so potentially you're going to get a different soliton than um, those with would come uh, without that. Um, we've also looked at you know, adding multiple fields. So for instance, the axiverse uh, often predicts many ultralight fields. So what if these ultralight fields all had some sort of contribution to the dark matter? What if the dark matter uh, only compromises some fraction of the total dark matter? Um, these cases have started to be studied as well. And you get kind of an interesting phenomenology, not just um, the effects on the granules coming out from the, these different fields, like averaging um, over each other. But, you know, uh, the ability of solitons to form is now different, where each um, state is trying to find essentially a different ground state. The interaction between these two is actually quite interesting. And I think perhaps this is maybe the most important direction that this field is going to go. So let me take a moment to talk about it. I think when you see future constraint plots from a talk like this, uh, which you'll probably see is a constraint plot more like this one, you kind of think um, in analogy with um, primordial black hole constraint plots, for instance. 
where we're not just looking at the mass now, but we're also looking at the kind of fraction of the dark matter that could exist in an ultralight field, right? Um, and so this constraint plot is from Keir Rogers. I think actually the field owes uh, Keir quite the, uh, the debt of gratitude because uh, this constraint plot has been one of the best ones since uh, the last major review was out. And, and really, I think it's very forward looking uh, into how this field is going to develop. So you should be looking, uh, be able to look at the constraint plots more like this and less like the ones I've shown you today, which I guess, you know, as a function of the mass. Uh, so in addition to those two things, we've looked at higher spin fields. So uh, this paper on vector dark matter, for instance, has found that both the solitons and the granules, um, interesting things could happen uh, as we increase the uh, series of freedom because of spin. And then there's also been some work recently looking at quantum correcting. This is actually uh, the majority of what I did for my uh, PhD thesis, for instance. It's showing that if, you know, if the quantum state is not what we as usually assume it is, which is a coherent state, right, the same state that describes freely propagating protons, um, then you can get kind of different uh, predictions for things like granules or um, this, this paper by David Moore showing how this, um, the different quantum states might couple to uh, uh, halo splits, for instance. And so each of these extensions has interesting um, phenomenology and resolves uh, the kind of existing tensions in, in different ways. And so I think you'll see um, the field kind of exploring this region of space and saying, well, okay, we know observations can rule out the vanilla model. Uh, what can observations say about you know, more general models? Kind of like how black hole super radiance applies not just to dark matter fields, but the kind of existence of fields, right? Like what can we say um, about uh, kind of like the existence of kind of really complicated dark matter models um, using all of the probes that we've learned. So uh, what you'll be seeing too is kind of an increasingly powerful constraint on the lower bound of the dark matter, right? So now I'm not just talking about the 10 to the minus 22 EV, which originally motivated this work, um, but talking about ultralight dark matter as a study of the um, lower mass bound on the dark and the kind of completely agnostic to um, what kind of models may or may not exist in the space. And so I like to think that this field is, is kind of future-proofed in, in, in two ways. Um, and the first is perhaps not so positive. So we have to kind of, uh, as a dark matter community, uh, kind of grapple with the fact that much of the space in which we were hoping to find dark matter, uh, we didn't, you know, for things like WIMPs. Um, and it's kind of becoming increasingly important, it seems, to be prepared for what you might call the worst case scenario for dark matter, right? Where the dark matter is essentially minimally coupled to the standard model, as in it doesn't talk to the standard model at all, except with um, with gravitational interactions, right? And so in this scenario, uh, you know, how we can continue to probe the parameter space um, is going to be, uh, you know, informed by um, work that has, has already kind of been making an assumption. And so the work at your very high mass set on like primordial black holes, for instance, and you're working your very low mass set on ultralight dark matter, right? it largely already kind of makes the assumption that we're in the worst case scenario. And so uh, as we move forward as a field kind of looking at these probes, we should be looking to this work to say, okay, well, uh, when this assumption has been made before, what have we been looking for? And then finally, uh, on a more positive note, right, future surveys are going to continue to probe smaller scales. They're going to continue to probe earlier times, right? And we know that fuzzy dark matter um, makes impacts in both of these areas. And so you'll see as these probes um, and these surveys get more and more sensitive, that lower mass bound on dark matter continue um, to walk up. So I'll end the talk here um, with this um, comparison of these two constraint plots sorted by a method on the left and uh, Fino on the right. Um, and I'll, uh, again, uh, thank everybody um, for coming.